I like that song, Anchor of My Soul, Don't Let Me Drift Away. It's very appropriate, not just, I like the song musically, but also that lyric will, will make sense hopefully in a couple of minutes. I've got a friend who I met just about a year ago at a conference where a, kind of a cohort of pastors that I'm a part of. He's pastor of a church called Canyon Ridge Church outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. And I texted him just to let him know that I was praying for him and for his church in the aftermath of the mass shootings, which were so unthinkable just over a week ago. He told me, he thanked me, and he told me that uh, they were seeing just this massive flood of people coming to the church at all hours that he'd never met before. Looking for hope, he said. They're coming looking for hope. It's an interesting word, hope. I've noticed this, this phenomenon that happened in, 2000, uh, in 9-11, 2001. It happens frequently when people face tragedy, uncertainty, deep sorrow, pain. They're looking, right? We're looking for hope, for answers in the midst of that. You, you can hear it all over our culture. You can hear it in the late night talk show theologians, if you pay attention. <laughs> Do you know we have those? Jimmy Fallon, in the response to this, the, week, the day after, said, we need to restore hope. The other Jimmy, Kimmel, said, we cannot give up on hope. Stephen Colbert, we must hold on to hope. Even Ellen said, I want this to be a show full of hope. We know we need it. We talk a lot about it. But I don't know that we know what it is, right? Hold on to hope. Restore hope. Don't give up on hope. Let's make this all about hope. What is that? What is that? Really, when we're crying out for that, looking for that, what is hope? That's precisely the question that we're going to look at here in our, in our study of the book of Hebrews. If you've not been with us, if you're just joining us, or if you're a guest or a visitor, we're in a series called Jesus is Greater. It's a study of the book of Hebrews, this New Testament letter that's written to Jewish Christians. That means they grew up Jewish, they have converted to faith in Jesus Christ. That's their background is Judaism, but now they are, they're followers of Jesus. And they're facing hardship and persecution and some really rough times because of their faith. And they're wondering if it's worth it. They're wondering if following Jesus is worth it. Perhaps you've asked that question of yourself. Is it worth it? And the writer of Hebrews is saying, it's worth it because nothing and no one is as great as Jesus. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20, the, the, the end of the chapter, this, this chapter, last few verses. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope he set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as our forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now we'll talk about that weird name at the end next week. If you want to know who, who Mel is, come back next week. One of the first things we see here in this passage was a little bit, it's, it's not immediately obvious, but one thing that should jump out to you if you're listening and pay attention is the Bible's view of hope has to do with the promises of God. That's what the Abraham story is about. We'll get to that in a minute. The Bible's view of hope has to do with the character of God and his ability to make good on his word. It's not, that's very different than what we think of as hope in our culture, isn't it? The power of positive thinking or optimism. I'm going to talk to you about the nature of hope for a minute, both biblically and just in our culture, the nature of hope. It's human to hope. We can't help it. Ecclesiastes 9.4 reads this way. He who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. <laughs> Meaning, to be alive is to have hope, is to hope. It's part of being, and if you, be, if you lose all hope, that's the beginning of the end for you. Secular 
positive psychologist Charles Snyder has developed what he calls hope theory, a cognitive, dynamic, motivational system. His premise is people who are hopeful tend to realize what they hope for more than, the, more than those who are not. Huh? You might have heard of optimism bias psychology. Anybody ever heard, heard that phrase, optimism bias? Research indicates, researchers, psychological researchers indicate that if I were to ask you all right now to rate yourselves in the following categories, below average, average, above average, far above average, in these categories, your intelligence, are you above average, below average, average? Your sense of humor, your ability to get along with other people, your appearance, your problem-solving ability, if I would ask you to rate yourself in those areas, researchers indicate that more than 80% of you would rate yourselves as far above average, which is statistically impossible. <laughs> we can't all be better than everyone else. I don't know if you know that or not. Tali Shero, uh, the researcher who coined the phrase optimism bias, says the human brain seems hardwired for hope. But real hope Biblical hope, the kind of hope my friend in Las Vegas is offering and sees people coming to his church looking for, that's got to be more than just positive thinking. That's got to be something more than just optimistic outlook on life, isn't it? Indeed, when the Bible talks about hope in this passage, it's talking about something much, much more than the power of positive thinking or having a good outlook. This kind of hope is not something you muster up that you manufacture inside of yourself. It comes from outside of you. It's founded on the character and nature of God. That's why the writer of, of Hebrews refers to this hope as an anchor. I want to talk to you for a minute about the anchor of hope. He calls it an anchor. Now, in the New Testament, hope is never a subjective feeling. We think of it that way, don't we? Do you feel hopeful today? And what we're talking about is how do I experience my circumstances? Do I feel optimistic and hopeful? That's not what the Bible means at all when it talks about hope. Like you, we say things like, I hope so. Prior to last year, if you'd asked me if the Cubs could win the World Series, I would have said, I hope so. But it was a vague wish stream. Now I know that it's possible. And so my hope is a little different this year. Although after last night, it's dwindling. But this is all about how I feel about what may or may not happen. That's not what the Bible talks about when it talks about hope. It's not your subjective feeling. It's an objective reality. So if I ask you, do you have hope? Most people are, are conditioned to think, do I feel hopeful? But what the Bible means is not how do you feel, do you have hope? Hope is an object. Hope is a person. Hope is a concrete, substantive thing that you have or you don't have. It's not how you feel at any given time. In the first two or three centuries uh, uh, AD, yes, I didn't say BCE. Uh, the church faced varying degrees of increasing persecution. I told you this. And, and at first it was the, the early Christians were facing persecution from Jews who saw Christianity as a, a rogue sect within Judaism. This false Messiah guy, Jesus. We put him to death. Now there's rumors about his resurrection. Who are these followers? Let's get rid of them. And then as time went on in the first century, first couple of centuries, the persecution shifted from Jewish persecution to Roman imperial persecution. Plagues and other fires and um, pestilence and certain things that were happening in the Roman Empire, the emperors would often look for a scapegoat and they began to choose Christians. They began to blame things on them, a, a group to say this is their fault. We've seen this happen before in human history, haven't we? And they, for various reasons, persecuted them harshly, severely, at certain points, the early Christians, the early church, had to meet in secret, kind of underground, actually underground, in the catacombs of Rome. Perhaps you've read about that. And they developed hidden or secret symbols to identify each other. They would carve them, actually, on the walls. St. Priscilla's catacombs in Rome has numerous carvings, early Christian symbols, so you could identify. And it wasn't a cross. That was not the earliest symbol. A cross is, is an instrument of torture in the ancient world. It's not something you'd use for a symbol. We do it today. We wear it around our neck. But in the first century, you didn't do that. You know what the earliest two symbols were? You know one of them. It's on the back of cars all the time. Right? The fish. 
ichthus. The Greek letters for the word fish, ichthus, stands for, like an acronym, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. So the fish, partly because the disciples were fishermen, partly because that acronym was like a, a hidden symbol. Just the simple two curved lines crossing to make the tail was the early Christian symbol for the church, for Christ followers. And you know what the other most common early symbol was? Can you guess? Take a wild stab in the dark guess based on this, the theme for this morning. It was an anchor. It was an anchor. In fact, it predated the fish. You'll see here a couple of images of some of these early uh, carvings in the catacombs. Marking Christians would see that and say, that's where we're meeting. Christ followers are here because of their persecution. It's not a symbol of their subjective experience or how they feel, that anchor. The anchor was a symbol of we share the same hope, the same objective, real, substantive hope in Jesus Christ. Now, you might not be aware of this, but the purpose of an anchor is not actually to be a cool decoration at your beach house or on your socks or on your nautical tie. The purpose of an anchor is what? To hold a ship securely in the harbor so it doesn't drift away, particularly in a storm. That's what a, an anchor's for. And years ago, when my kids were little, I have two in college and one who's in a junior in high school, but when they were little, little, little like three, four, five years old, we uh, had a friend that loaned us this cottage for a vacation. We went out to, to Michigan in this little lake, not Lake Michigan, a much smaller lake, but uh, I think it was called Sand Lake, if I remember correctly. And we got to use all of his water toys, which was fantastic. And we had a pontoon boat, and I took it out with the kids. My wife was on the shore. I think she was reading or knitting or something. And I had all three kids with their life jackets on. And we went out in the, in the pontoon boat in the middle of the lake. It was breezy, but not crazy windy. And they wanted to swim. No problem, let's go swimming. They're all cinched up in their life jackets. So I put the anchor down. I let out some rope, let out some rope. It was just a little thing, you know. I let, let out some rope and thought, that's got to be deep enough. Tied it off, jumped in. Kids and I are swimming around, having a good time. They're climbing on me and we're floating around. And my wife is waving from the shore. I'm looking at her, the boat's on the other side of me. And she's waving. I'm like, what, what, she knows I can't hear her. What is she doing? She's interrupting our playtime. What does she want? I can't hear her. And she's waving wildly and pointing. I turn around, and the boat is in the reeds 600 yards across the lake. I don't know if you know this or not. I mean, if you've not been part of, if you're not, if you're not nautical like I am, you, you may not know this. The anchor only works if it goes all the way to the bottom. If it just hangs in the water, it doesn't do much. I don't know if you know this. It has to go down, all the way down, and it has to grab onto something, or the boat, it doesn't make a difference. The earliest anchors were just rocks with a ring pounded into it, an iron ring pounded into it, or maybe nets full of rocks. Then they developed the anchors that would have hooks on them to hold. And it, they, they, today, ship anchors, I was doing a little fun digging online about ship anchors. They can get massive. Have you seen some of these incredibly, I, I researched, could I get a huge anchor to put outside for you guys to walk through? It would cost a lot to just to, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big anchor right there. That anchor weighs in excess of 50 tons, but it's not the largest. The largest anchor weighs 77 tons. Each link of the chain is over 600 pounds that holds those anchors. But even those anchors, the ships of the large, do nothing unless they what? Go down all the way to the bottom and grab hold of something solid. Now, notice when I read through chapter 6 in verse 19, it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And it goes, the phrase is, it goes behind the inner curtain. The inner place behind the curtain. What is that all about? Now, if you were here last week, you heard the sermon on Jesus, our great high priest. Do you remember this? He passed through the heavens. He did what the high priest did every year at Yom Kippur. Jesus did once for all time. He went into the inner place, the holy of holies. That's the reference to the curtain. In Matthew 27, verse 51, we read these words, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. This is a reference to the moment that Jesus Christ died on the cross, breathed his last, gave up his spirit, said, it is finished. At that moment, the earth shook, rocks split, and the temple curtain, not your drapes, but the temple curtain. These are pretty heavy, thick curtains. I was here when we installed these curtains. These are nothing compared to the temple curtain. It was six, more than six inches thick, the, the, just the curtain fabric itself, torn from top to bottom. That was the veil that divided the outer tabernacle or temple from the Holy of Holies, the symbolic place where God dwelled. You can't go there. You seen Red as the Lost Ark? What happens if you go into the Holy of Holies and you touch the Ark of the Covenant? Your face melts. That's not actually biblical, but it's close. <laughs> right? 
You can't go into God's presence. He's holy, unapproachable. But because of Jesus, we can. That's the hope, you see. The anchor is, it goes all the way in, behind the veil. So when we read about an anchor, the image is, our anchor, Jesus Christ, has gone all the way in. And he must go all the way down to the bottom of your heart and mine and grab hold. Or it doesn't do any good. You still drift. Jesus has gone all the way in the very presence of God for you and for me. Who is your anchor? Jesus. How deep does he go? All the way. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. That's why he calls our hope an anchor. Your hope is not how you feel in your difficult circumstances. Your hope is the one who's gone all the way for you, regardless of how you feel in any given moment. It's an objective reality. And you need that when the world seems off kilter, when horrible things happen, when your life feels like it's just a little boat being tossed at sea. Because biblical hope is based on God's word, not my wishes. If you're a note taker, or even if you're not, you gotta write that down. Biblical hope is based on God's word, not your wishes. I, I wish certain things. I, I, on a human level, hope certain things happen. But biblical hope is based on the word of God. This is the point of this whole section about Abraham. We don't have time to go into it in detail, but this whole section from 13 to 18, those verses that I read through, where he's talking about Abraham's pro God's promise to Abraham, that's a reference back to Genesis chapter 12 through 15. God makes a covenant with Abraham. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. Abraham doesn't have any children. He says, I'm getting old. I'm 75. Where's the child? God gives him a child, right? At 95 years old, so he has to wait a long time for that child of the promise. And God confirms his word with an oath. Now, the writer of Hebrews says, people swear by something greater than themselves. In the ancient world, if I promised you something and you doubted my word, I would swear an oath by something greater than both of us. In Jesus' day, they would swear by the temple or the stones of the temple or the, some artifact, right? Something greater. It was, a, it was an ancient way of saying my word is good. We would prefer a legal contract in our day, but that's a similar idea. Making assurance of your promise. So God has promised Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Abraham's struggling to believe that promise. What is God going to swear by that's greater than himself? Class? Nothing. Right? Who's greater than God? Nothing and no one. There's nothing else for him to swear by. So what does he do? He, swear by, he swears by his own word. He makes an oath based on the promise he just made. He, I give you my word, and I give you my oath based on that word. Now why did he give an oath? Not because God's going to break his promise because Abraham needed it. It was a condescension to our level saying, I understand how you human beings make and break promises all the time. I understand how fickle you are. I'm not like that. So I'll make an oath based on my word. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, based on two things by which it's impossible for God to lie. Did you catch that? What are those two things? His word and his oath. I told you I would do this. I'm swearing by that. Trust me and see if I don't make good of my promise. And he does, and he has, and he will. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 tells us, the hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. I told you before that biblical hope is based on God's word, his faithfulness to his word, not on your wishes or your desires. So, so when awful things happen, we read about them in the news, or if they happen much closer to home, it's one thing, I, I hope this doesn't happen again. And we, we want some security and some assurance, and so we begin to debate policies and, and gun control laws and mental health procedures, and we should debate those things. Those things matter. But ultimately speaking, it's not our hope. It's not our hope. You can't legislate this kind of hope. It comes from the rock-solid certainty of who Jesus is and what he's done. You see, Jesus Christ is God's answer to every promise he's ever made. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says it this way. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. This is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Every promise God's ever made in Scripture 
is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It's God's great yes to all of his promises. Some 7,000 different promises to his people all find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. That's our hope. He's God's yes to you. That's why, by the way, we are unapologetically all about Jesus around here. If you're new, if you're visiting our church, or you're just maybe coming from a different uh, religious background or church background and figuring out who we are, we're unapologetically all about Jesus. I was asked to speak, uh, actually to pray, uh, at a civil event a couple of years ago. And the lady who asked me to pray, I know her and she's very kind, she said, would you pray, but would you just not mention Jesus, just pray in general to God or higher powers? I said, no. I said, well, first I said, yes, I'd be happy to pray. And then she gave me the caveat, I said, I can't do that. She said, why not? I said, because I only know one way to pray. I only know one way to access God. It's through Jesus Christ. When you say, in Jesus' name I pray, amen, that's not just a Christian way of saying, mm, the end, or good, good, hang it up now, God, right? <laughs> it's, it's because I access God through Jesus. I have access to the Father through the Son. He's the one who's gone all the way in and made a way for us that I could come into the presence of God. So we're unapologetically about Jesus around here. And that's a good thing. I know in our culture it's increasingly maybe not all that politically correct. But it's, it's the only way we know how to be. It's the only hope. He's the anchor. He's the anchor for your soul. Strong and steadfast. There isn't another one. How can you talk about hope if you're not going to talk about Jesus? Jesus. You're just talking about our wish, our human desires. You ever notice how people put the word so at the end of hope? I hope so. I hope so, but it's sort of just this vague thing. I hope it works out. I hope it happens. Optimism, positive outlook, these are good things. I'm a fairly positive person. My wife calls me a dreamer. I think she's a, a, you know, a pessimist, but she calls herself a realist. We have debates about that. That's a good thing. You should be optimistic as far as it goes. But it doesn't go far enough, right? It doesn't go all the way to the bottom. Last, the power of hope. The power of hope. Remember when I told you these Christians are facing persecution for their faith, right? These early Christians, they're, they're suffering and in danger increasingly because of their faith in Jesus Christ. It's important to notice that what's offered to them what the writer of Hebrews offers to these Christians and to us is never once a promise that your life won't be hard. Nowhere to, to these Christians or to us is the promise, listen, if you just trust Jesus, all your problems go away. He, the promise is, the hope is not that you'll stop being persecuted. We'd like it to be that, wouldn't we? If it were up to us, just make this go away, God. I hope this stops. I hope she gets better. I hope this, right? But it's, it's about our circumstances. That's not what's promised to you and to me. What's promised to them is the presence of God in the midst of that pain, that he's with you. And what's also promised to you, which is greater, is that the future, the ultimate outcome, is certain. It's not in question. It's not in doubt. Most of us think hope, hope works this way. Like, you look at past circumstances and somehow that gives you hope for the future, right? Well, I've seen this happen before where I know this in the past, like my silly example of the Cubs. It could happen. It's happened before. I've, I've seen somebody been healed by this treatment. I know this could happen. And I, that, I understand that. I have that going on in my heart too. We think that what's happened in the past would help me move into the future with hope. But actually what the Bible's saying is the way the where the Christian hope works, the way hope in Jesus works is that your view of the rock-solid certainty of the future runs back to you in the present. It's not the past that gives you hope, although we do have the, the crucifixion and the resurrection, but it's the future certainty that runs back into your heart. I know ultimately how things are going to work out. Some of you knew Pastor Roger Kreitz, who died a number of years ago, was a beloved member of our staff and died of cancer, and he said frequently, I may not be healed, or I may not be cured, he said, but I was healed a long time ago. What he meant was, I know where I'm going to be. I know my ultimate destination. And so I pray, and I cry out to God for mercy, and I want to be cured now, and I, and I can ask God for that. But whatever happens, I still have that hope, which nothing can shake. That's the anchor. That future certainty runs back and holds me fast 
in this present storm. It's not, you know, I'm basing it on a wish dream or what I've seen happen in the past. Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25 If I could find 24. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope we do not see, we wait for it with patience. It's the future certainty that runs back to us in our present. Now I've heard some people criticize this kind of Christian view. That it's like escapist thinking. That you, in fact I've, been, I've, I've had debates like this. That you Christians are so, you're worried about heaven but you're not really focused on this life. Like right now, there's stuff that's going on that matters and we should do something about it. Well, my friend C.S. Lewis, and your friend too, (laughs) has something to say about this in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking. It's one of the things a Christian man or woman must do. We are meant to do. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for this present world were just those who thought most about the next. Isn't that good? Those who are most effective here and now in this life are the ones who are most secure in the next. When you have that anchor as a security, when you have that hope that can't be taken or shaken or undone, then you're free to work for justice and righteousness and mercy and love and peace right here, right now. Because I know who holds the future. I know my security. It's an anchor. It's immovable. It's steadfast. It's firm, he says. It is our hope in Jesus Christ and what he will ultimately do, his salvation, his restoration of all things that enables me to live in the present moment free, to work for his kingdom, to make a difference. I'm, I'm not desperately trying to gather my own security in, that, in, my, in my 401k or in my career advancement or in the success of my children or whatever. I'm not desperately trying to hold on to something in this life because I know ultimately I'm secure in him. It frees you. To live now for his glory. That's what Paul's saying in Romans 8. We just read that, right? We, we, we wait for it patiently. We, we know what's coming. Friends, with all my heart, I, I speak on behalf of our whole staff and leadership here. With all our hearts, we want you to know this hope. What a shame that you would come to church twice a month, on average, most of you. Sit here, hear God's word taught, and never know the anchor for your soul. Never have that security. If you're here and you're wondering, where do I stand with God? Is he angry about my past? Is he holding my sins against me? If you feel unsettled, if you're in your life and you feel adrift, you feel like there's a lot of waves in in this world, what a shame that you would not know the anchor for your soul. This is what the writer of Hebrews is saying to those early Christians who are thinking, is it worth to follow Jesus? Is it worth it? Because I'm facing some hard stuff. He says to them and he says to you and to me, it's worth it because Jesus is greater. Where else are you going to go to find this kind of hope? What else can you latch on to? What else can hold your life fast in the storm? Nothing and no one. That's our hope. Let's pray. Father God, we confess to you that sometimes we're just guilty of wishful thinking, which isn't bad as far as it goes, but it does not go nearly far enough. We thank you that you have given us not a subjective feeling, but a rock-solid objective reality, the hope we have in your Son, Jesus Christ, that he is the one who has gone all the way into your presence on our behalf. May his love and grace descend all the way to the bottom of our hearts as the anchor for our souls. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.